Good morning and welcome. Thank you. I'm Carolyn Petey. I'm uh, with Fair Housing. I'm the executive director of Fair Housing of Marin. Um, and I'm thrilled to see you all here today. Um, we really felt this conference would be a great way to kick, kick off uh, Fair Housing Month. Um, and hopefully all of you know that April is Fair Housing Month. As I said, we have a very, very full day. I want to actually start um, by sharing something that I just happened to see um, over the weekend. I was looking at, at something in print, and I, um, I wanted to share this, uh, a quote with you that puts this day into perspective for me. It's something that was written by Gary Cunningham. And he said, segregation matters most because it shapes and reflects the distribution of opportunity. Segregation has never been simply about the sorting of people, but about sorting of opportunity and the resources that shape life chances. Since segregation is about inclusion, or sorry, exclusion, we must not only understand how exclusion happens, but how we might achieve inclusion. I really like that quote. And it, for me, it really sets the tone for the day. I thank you all for believing that the, con the conversations and the discussions that we're going to have today are important enough to spend a day here together so that we can explore them together. And I don't think you'll be disappointed. I want to thank our co-sponsors who contributed funds and other resources to this event, the County of Marin, Marin Community Foundation, Marin Association of Realtors, Marin Economic Forum, and Community Action Marin Asian Advocacy Project. Thanks also to Community Media Center of Marin for offering their services to videotape the first session. I really appreciate that. So the flow of the day. We'll hear first from our keynote speaker, Richard Rothstein, who will set the stage for the day by talking about the ways in which government policies uh, shaped the segregated living patterns that we see today. I would like to thank Adriana Ames. Is Adriana here? I would like to thank Adriana Ames, our education director, who worked long hours with me in making this conference come together. And I can tell you she's very short on sleep and has been so for the past, well, I don't know how long, um, to pull together the logistics of this conference. So thank you, Adriana. I really appreciate it. A couple of years ago, we had a vision for uh, a conference that culminated in a, uh, an event that many of you attended uh, last year in, the January, in January of 2015. And it generated so much interest. Uh, and given developments during the past year, we thought, we better do this again. Um, so we need to continue the, to continue the dialogue and um, the exploration of some of the themes that we addressed a year ago. The 2015 conference would not have been as successful, and this year's conference probably would not have been possible had it not been for the participation and support of Supervisor Judy Arnold, who played a major role in garnering, garnering sponsorships um, and, getting, and telling people about the conference and helping spread the word. So I want to thank her for her unwavering support of Fair Housing over the years and for helping make today a success. So please help me in thanking and welcoming Judy Arnold. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. And thank you to Fair Housing of Marin for bringing all of us together to address barriers to fair housing choice. The County of Marin and Fair Housing of Marin have enjoyed a long partnership. The one thing that they haven't helped us master, which hopefully we can, is how the heck do you do an elevator speech explaining f analysis of impediments to fair housing choice? It isn't easy. But this partnership that the county has with fair housing was strengthened five years ago when we partnered to create the analysis of impediment to fair housing choice and the implementation plan due to concerns from HUD about discrimination and Marin's fair housing policies. These documents identify barriers in Marin, which include laws, regulations, administrative procedures, and practices 
that may have the effect of, in, of limiting housing choices for groups protected by fair housing laws. Working together, we have made great strides over the past few years in addressing some of the barriers that were identified. Just a few of the accomplishments that we have managed to do include expanded the Community Development Block Grant Committee to include non-elected community representatives of protected classes, expanded diversity programs for county staff, increased the amount of information we provide in Spanish and English, our county library has developed a collaborative partnership with local schools in targeted communities to overcome barriers to library use by handing out library cards, waiving prior late fees, and developing after school and summer programs. And on the housing front, the county recently purchased two family complexes to preserve as affordable housing in Forest Knolls and Fairfax. These are two areas that are outside minority concentration areas in Marin. While we have made progress, there is still work to be done to make Marin a more welcoming and tolerant community for our entire community. And I look forward to continuing these efforts with Fair Housing of Marin and people like you who are here today to win and, and support this dedication. Today's conference will be a learning experience for everyone as it was last year. And we hope that there will be something that each person can take away by the end of the day. And I hope that you all will share and, and gain a better understanding and grasp of fair housing law, the benefits of greater inclusion and diversity in, in our community, and how you can make a difference. Thank you all for coming today. Good, have a good time. So you all have Richard Rothstein's bio, although I understand it's a bit outdated. He's done ever so much since then. But um, rather than recap what's there, um, I will simply say this. I heard Richard Rothstein speak um, first on Terry Gross's Fresh Air some time ago, some time back, where I, um, she was interviewing him about his writing of uh, The Making of Ferguson. I had the opportunity to hear him at the United States uh, Department of HUD's 2015 uh, National Fair Housing Training and Policy Conference last September. He articulated something about segregation that most of the fair housing advocates in the room, including myself, were more or less familiar with, uh, but somehow he synthesized the information in a way, um, in such a way that was profoundly moving for us. And somehow reminded us of the importance of the work that we do and that we must continue to do. When I thought about this conference, um, I thought about how crucial it was for all of us to hear uh, his message. Uh, and I really, really wanted to have Richard Rothstein here. And so I am, um, was thrilled when he said <coughs> that he would agree to, to come and speak with us today. Um, so it is my incredible pleasure and honor to welcome Richard Rothstein. Thank you very much, Carolyn, and uh, thanks to all of you for uh, welcoming here, me here today and asking me to come speak with you. Um, let me get right to it. Over the last year or two, actually more two now, um, we've had a number of incidents in this country that have drawn attention again to the issue of race. It began with the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson and then a similar incidents elsewhere in the country. And as these incidents unfolded, many people were forced to confront the fact that we had segregated communities around the country, not just in urban areas, but segregated suburbs like Ferguson, where African Americans, both lower middle class, middle class, and low income were concentrated and not living 
equally uh, throughout metropolitan areas. And it was natural for people to begin to wonder how this happened. How did we get to a situation in this country where we have segregated neighborhoods, uh, African-American neighborhoods separated from white neighborhoods throughout the United States in every metropolitan area? We have similar patterns of segregation. <clears throat> and the conventional view uh, is that this is something called de, de, de facto segregation. We have de facto segregation. And this is a notion that's been promulgated initially by the Supreme Court, but um, has spread throughout uh, the policy community, liberals and conservatives. We all understand that we have de facto segregation in this country. And de facto segregation was created, we think, uh, because of private prejudice, Perhaps real estate agents steered white families to some communities and African Americans elsewhere. Or perhaps there was white flight when African Americans moved into certain neighborhoods. Or perhaps people just like to live with others of the same color. Um, real estate agents discriminated, private people discriminated. Um, all of this comes together in a package and created uh, de facto segregation. Uh, African Americans have incomes that are typically low and unable to afford to move into middle class communities, and that also contributed. The Supreme Court developed a theory that where you have de facto segregation, which is what characterizes the country, there is no constitutional remedy because the only remedy that is permissible for segregation is where segregation was created de jure by explicit government law, public policy, and regulation. And since we don't have de jure segregation in this country, uh, there is no constitutionally required remedy for it. Of course, we can prevent ongoing discrimination. That's what the Fair Housing Act was designed to do. But we can't do anything to reverse the existing segregation in the society because it wasn't created by government. I first uh, uh, was forced to confront this in a very direct way because I used to spend almost all my time uh, writing and researching about education policy. And in 2007, the United States Supreme Court issued a decision in which it prohibited the school districts of Louisville and Seattle from um, a token, very token integration plan. Both the school districts allowed uh, high school students to choose which high school in the city they would go to, but if their choice would tend to further imbalance racially the high school population, uh, their choice would be um, second, second, put in second place to somebody who would tend to integrate the population. So if you had a white high school, with only one place left and both an African-American and a white student uh, applied for it, the African-American student would be given preference because he would help or she would help to integrate the um, school. And the Supreme Court said that was impermissible. You couldn't integrate the schools in Seattle and Louisville that way because the schools in Louisville and Seattle were racially homogenous. You had black schools, you had white schools because they were located in racially homogenous neighborhoods. And because those neighborhoods were segregated de facto, not by government policy, but just because of the factors that I described before, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, now, that wasn't surprising coming from Chief Justice John Roberts, who, uh, along with his uh, conservative colleagues for the last four decades, had been arguing this point of de facto segregation. What was surprising to me was that the dissenting opinion that was written by uh, Justice Stephen Breyer, as he dissented from Robert's opinion, but it was, his opinion went as follows. Yes, of course we have de facto segregation in Louisville and Seattle, but where you have de facto segregation, you should be permitted to integrate even though you can't be compelled to do so. And I read that decision and it uh, sort of changed my life because I said to myself, if even Stephen Breyer thinks we have de facto segregation in this country, we've got a lot of work to do. Because I knew a little bit about the fact that every met area, metropolitan area in this country 
was segregated and remains segregated by explicit racially conscious public policy. It's not the accident of, of well-intended policies that had disparate impact. It's not because of the unintended consequences of, of other policies. It's not because of all the de facto reasons, income differences or private prejudice that I described. It's because of federally ex racially explicit public policy, policy that was designed consciously to segregate the nation by race. And that's very um, hard for many people to understand because we've forgotten this history. We have completely forgotten it. It used to be well known. It used to be well known how the federal government, together with state and uh, uh, local governments, segregated the country by race. But we've forgotten it, and we've adopted this myth of de facto segregation. So I've spent the last few years trying to remind people of this once well-known history. There's very little that I've done is original. Uh, it used to be well known of how the government segregated every metropolitan area, including the San Francisco Bay Area. This is not something that happened in the South. This is not a form of Jim Crowism in the South. This was a federally explicit racial policy across the country. Well, there are many, many aspects of this, and uh, I'm going to focus in, in the limited time I have on two main ones. But there are many others, and perhaps I'll have a chance to, to just allude to a few of them. The two main policies were the um, public housing policy of the federal government in collaboration with state and local governments, and the uh, mortgage uh, insurance policy of the federal government. Public housing, I know you all think of public housing as a place where low-income families live. Uh, maybe they are single parents, maybe they, uh, they're certainly uh, unemployed, they're, uh, they have um, low incomes, uh, many, many on welfare. Uh, the, the, they often are dysfunctional, uh, and they're inhabited primarily by African American and uh, in, uh, increasingly in, in some parts of the country, particularly here, by Latino uh, families and perhaps other recent immigrants. I want you to try to put that thought aside for a minute because that is not how public housing was designed in this country. Public housing, when it first began, and uh, for civilians, uh, it began in the New Deal. When Franklin Roosevelt uh, took office in 1933, it began as a program for white middle-class families, working-class and middle-class families. At the time, we, had just, uh, we, we were in the midst of the Great Depression, and um, many, many white families were uh, without housing. They had either been evicted because uh, they couldn't pay their rent or they lost their homes because they couldn't keep up with their um, uh, house payments. And so we had large numbers of homeless people around the country. We also had a construction industry that was moribund because there was no demand for housing. So the public housing program was began um, by the Public Works Administration in 1933 to try to address the housing crisis of these white middle class and, and lower middle class families. The Public Works Administration built housing across the country, both to provide housing for these unemployed uh, and, and homeless uh, white families and to stimulate the construction industry for which there was no demand without the government's uh, per, uh, uh, commissioning of housing. And it built housing around the country. The head of the Public Works Administration was a man named Harold Ickes. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that name because uh, his son is a prominent uh, democratic strategist today. But this is the father, Harold, Harold Ickes. He was a liberal. He was the most liberal member of the Roosevelt administration in the New Deal. He had been president of the NAACP in Chicago before he came to Washington to head the Public Works Administration. And he insisted that some housing be built for African Americans as well as for whites. Now remember, he did not say that housing should be integrated. He said that in addition to the housing that the federal government was building around the country for white families explicitly, we should build a few projects for African Americans as well. That was how liberalism was expressed uh, in the early New Deal. And indeed, the, federal, the, the Public Works Administration built housing around the country in the 1930s on a segregated basis. Now, Harold Ickes um, had a rule. He was Secretary of the Interior, and his rule was something he called the Neighborhood Composition Rule which was that if you built public housing in a black neighborhood, it should be for blacks. If you build public housing in a white neighborhood, it should be built for whites. 
Now again, this is not because whites happened to apply to some projects and African Americans happened to apply to others. This was an explicit, open racial designation of public housing projects. And what it did was it segregated neighborhoods in cities around the country that had never known segregation before. Because in the 1930s, many urban areas were integrated. They were integrated because workers didn't have automobiles. And they had to live close enough to the factories where they worked in order to be able to walk to work. So you had neighborhoods where Irish immigrants and Italians and Jews and migrants from the South, from, from rural areas in the South and Midwest, and African Americans were all living together. Um, I, I recall reading an autobiography of Langston Hughes, who grew up in Cleveland. And he described how in Cleveland, uh, he lived in an integrated neighborhood. Uh, in that neighborhood, he, he dated a, a Jewish girl, took her to the prom. His best friend was Italian. It was an integrated neighborhood in Cleveland. Cleveland doesn't know integrated neighborhoods today. The Public Works Administration came into Cleveland and built segregated public housing, taking integrated neighborhoods and segregating them in, with public housing, creating segregation in a way it had never been known before. Uh, Carolyn mentioned that I wrote uh, once about um, St. Louis, uh, once, just a couple of years ago, <laughs> about St. Louis. In St. Louis, there was an integrated neighborhood in downtown called the DeSoto Car neighborhood. The DeSoto Car neighborhood um, was about half white, half black. Uh, the public works, the, the city of St. Louis uh, got funds from the Public Works Administration to build public housing. And what it eventually wound up was demolishing the integrated neighborhood, the DeSoto Car neighborhood, demolishing it in order to create space for public housing for African Americans only. And a separate project was built south of downtown for whites, segregating St. Louis in a way it had not be previously been segregated. Now, I haven't um, uh, mentioned uh, the Bay Area yet because there were very few African Americans in the Bay Area prior to World War II. There were some. Uh, Pullman car porters, for example, uh, were African-American, and they lived in the integrated West Oakland neighborhood. Uh, it wasn't a black neighborhood at that time. The West Oakland population at the time, prior to World War II, was about 1%. But there were some Pullman car porters and, and uh, uh, their wives who worked as domestics living in the West Oakland neighborhood um, in an integrated fashion. But come World War II, as you know, there was a massive influx not only of African Americans, but of white workers to this area because of uh, the defense industry, particularly shipbuilding. Here in Marin, in Sausalito, Marin Ship was uh, one of the major ship uh, building uh, uh, companies in, in, in the country, uh, building ships for the war, and particularly in Richmond and in Oakland. The first um, uh, shipyard was built in Oakland, the Moore Dry Dock, and then uh, Henry J. Kaiser came to Richmond and built shipyards, four shipyards in Richmond that became the major shipbuilding center in the country. Richmond, um, at the start of World War II, had an African-American population of 270. Tiny, tiny African-American population in a city that was about 15,000. Uh, most of them uh, had been recruited to Richmond uh, uh, in the 1920s. Their families had been recruited to Richmond in the 1920s as strike breakers for the Pullman Company, which manufactured um, uh, Pullman cars uh, in Richmond and um, had a unionization drive of its white workers, and so it recruited African Americans as strike breakers. So that was the origin of the Richmond African-American community, as I say, 270 or so out of a population of 15,000. By the end of World War II, that 270 African-American population had grown to about 15,000. And the 20,000 white population of Richmond had grown to 115,000. Now, I don't know if you can imagine what it's like for a city to grow at that rate in a period of, of four years, going the city as a whole growing from about 20,000 to um, 125,000 in just four years. And the workers who were flocking to uh, Richmond to get jobs in the shipbuilding industry had no place to live. They were living in, in um, hovels made of cardboard boxes in open fields. Uh, if they had cars, uh, they were living in their cars. And the federal government had to come in and build housing. <laughs> 
for these workers. And so the federal government did. Now remember, there were only 270 African Americans in Richmond uh, prior to the war in a city whose population was um, roughly 20,000. This was not a segregated community. The federal government segregated Richmond by building separate housing for African Americans and for whites. The African American housing was shoddily constructed. It was built along the railroad tracks and uh, near the shipbuilding yards. The housing for whites was um, much more stable, uh, uh, much more solidly constructed. It was built further inland uh, where the white neighborhoods lived. Again, this is not because the African Americans chose to live in the, in the public housing along the railroad tracks and the whites chose to live in uh, the housing and further inland. This was an explicit federal policy. The only place in the Bay Area which was integrated, where there was integrated public housing, was actually here in Marin, uh, uh, where the Marin ship um, shipbuilding took place. And this wasn't purposely integrated. It's just that the Marin ship uh, uh, grew so rapidly that uh, workers came in, uh, they, built, uh, they put up dormitories quickly and just handed out blankets and pillows as soon as they got there. And the workers just went and took whichever rooms were available. But that surprised uh, the, the administrators of the housing in Marin because they expected there to be trouble if it was a racially integrated uh, program, and there was none. And so that set a pattern for integrated public housing in Marin in a way that didn't exist anywhere else in the Bay Area and in very, very few other places in the country. In Oakland uh, during the war, the federal government built housing for white workers in East Oakland. And in West Oakland, which, as you recall, I mentioned a few minutes ago, was an integrated community. It built housing for African Americans only, turning West Oakland into an African American ghetto. Berkeley was a, a, an interesting case. Uh, after uh, workers continued to, to flood into uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and uh, the public housing that had been built in Richmond and in Oakland and, in, uh, and for the workers in Sausalito uh, in Marin uh, were filled, the government had to build more. So it came to the cities of Berkeley and Albany and proposed uh, a public housing project in the area just along the, the, the shoreline uh, to um, house workers who would then commute to Richmond and to Oakland for uh, war work. The cities of Berkeley and Albany both refused. They're one of the few places in the country that refused to allow the federal government to build public housing um, in their communities because explicitly they didn't want to have African Americans living in their communities um, and um, they knew that if public housing would, were to be built, there would be African Americans living. This was not Again, they didn't use code words then. Uh, this was quite explicit on the part of the city councils and the chambers of commerce and the other officials in both Berkeley and Albany. Um, and so the federal government actually seized land from the cities of Berkeley and Albany and built a project called Cotternesis Village that was uh, spanned the border between Albany and uh, Berkeley just uh, west of San Pablo Avenue. And they built a housing project, the federal government, on a segregated basis. The, pro the buildings for African Americans were located closer to the shoreline. The buildings for whites were built cl closer to the San Pablo Air uh, Avenue to the shopping areas and um, uh, other community life of the city of Albany in particular. <clears throat> Eventually, um, the um, uh, civil rights groups protested against this policy, and the federal government began to spread buildings throughout the, the, the Cotternesis village so that not all African-American buildings were on the west side, and not all African-American, not all white buildings were on the east side, but never integrated them. Um, and that went on um, throughout the war and after the war. At the, end, in, at the end of the war, the federal government had a policy that uh, the the temporary public housing that it had built during the war for workers had to be demolished and uh, the land turned over either to, um, back to the, the owners to, from whom it was seized or the local authorities could take over the housing. 
uh, both Albany and Berkeley refused to take over the housing that uh, was now that had been created for the war workers. They said this was an area that was unsuitable for housing. So the Codonesis Village was then demolished, uh, and a few years later, the University of California built housing for married students in that area, and University Village still exists in that um, location today. Well, this went on all over the country, all over the country, um, neighborhoods, communities, cities that had not been segregated before um, were segregated by the public housing program. Uh, communities that did have racial patterns, of course, had them reinforced and rigidified by this, this program. After the war, there was a, um, still an enormous civilian housing shortage. Uh, during World War II, the, the federal government had prohibited uh, the use of building materials for civilian housing construction. So the shortage of housing grew. Uh, uh, veterans then returned to the country and formed families, and they had no housing. They were living in Quonset huts and uh, doubled or tripled up with relatives and their in-laws. Um, uh, I guess those are relatives too. Huh? Yeah, they were doubled up with, with relatives. And uh, the federal government... Uh, again had to address the problem because there was no civilian housing being built. So in 1949, President Truman, uh, who succeeded Roosevelt as president uh, in 1945, uh, President Truman proposed a massive public housing program in the National Housing Act of 1949. Conservatives in Congress were opposed to any public housing. This had, not, had, had nothing to do with race. It had to do with the fact that they were opposed to public involvement of any kind in the private sector and they wanted to defeat President Truman's Housing Act. And so they came up with a, uh, a poison pill amendment as an attempt to defeat the na 1949 National Housing Act. I don't know if you're familiar with a poison pill amendment. Um, a poison pill amendment is an amendment that opponents of a bill put on a bill hoping that if, it, if the amendment passes, that will make the entire bill unpalatable to a majority and the whole bill will go down to defeat. Probably the most famous poison pill amendment um, in our history was in 1964 when uh, opponents of the Civil Rights Act uh, that was designed to uh, give African Americans rights to voting and to public accommodations and to housing. Uh, opponents of the Civil Rights Act decided that they could defeat it by a poison pill amendment, and they put forward an amendment to the 1964 Civil Rights Act saying that it also had to apply to women. You couldn't discriminate against women either. Ha, 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 that'll get this bill defeated. Nobody will vote for that. And lo and behold, the amendment passed, but uh, so did the bill. And by this accident, we now have a law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. But had it not been for this clever poison pill amendment gone awry, uh, that would not have happened. Well, going back to 1949, conservatives in Congress decided they could defeat the National Housing Act by putting forward an amendment requiring that public housing no longer be segregated. They would put forward a non-segregation, a non-discrimination amendment to the 1949 Housing Act, expecting that if the amendment passed, Southern Democrats, who supported public housing because they wanted segregated public housing in their own communities, would then turn against the entire public housing bill. And liberals in Congress, led by Hubert Humphrey uh, and Senator Paul Douglas, who was uh, his mentor in, in the Senate, um, liberals in Congress campaigned against the integration amendment and persuaded their fellow northern liberals to vote against the integration amendment. So the integration amendment was defeated. And the public housing bill then went on to be passed. And with that 1949 public housing bill, we saw these giant towers built around the country on a segregated basis um, as the 1949 Housing Act uh, uh, explicitly permitted. As again, returning to St. Louis, you're familiar with the pruitt Igo Towers. pruitt Igo became the symbol of dysfunctional public housing, uh, built in the early 1950s with funds from the 1949 uh, National Housing Act. And uh, that project, which we call pruitt Igo today and think of as a project that, that became dysfunctional with low-income families, was originally two projects. 
The Pruitt Project was for African Americans. The IGO Project was for whites. Again, not because the African Americans decided they'd rather live in Pruitt than IGO and vice versa. It was because this was explicitly designated by the federal government and the city of St. Louis as two separate projects. Well, shortly after Pruitt IGO was built, uh, all of a sudden, there were large numbers of vacancies in the white IGO project and long waiting lists for the uh, Pruitt project for African Americans. And this happened around the country in public housing at the same time. Here in Marin, which had the, one of the few integrated public housing projects in the country, all of a sudden the only people who were applying were African Americans and whites were leaving. Well, how did that happen? That happened because of a second federal program, and this was a program of the federal government that was explicitly designed, and again, I want to emphasize it was explicitly designed, to move the white population of this country out of urban areas and into all white suburbs. Uh, the Federal Housing Administration gave production guarantees to builders of subdivisions, entire suburbs, uh, to build housing on condition. The production guarantees were granted on condition that uh, the homes only be sold to whites, that no African Americans be permitted to live in these places. Perhaps the best known of uh, these uh, developments nationwide is, is one, um, it's actually in New York, not New Jersey. Uh, it's in New York, uh, called Levittown. Uh, maybe you're familiar with it, I know it's far away, but uh, uh, William Levitt uh, bought, uh, uh, built this project of 17,000 homes in 1947. Levitt could never have come up with the funds to build 17,000 homes before he had any buyers for them. The only way he got these funds was the Federal Housing Administration approved his plans as they looked over the specifications of the homes he was going to build, the, the materials he was going to use, uh, the language of the deeds, and a requirement that no homes be sold to African Americans. And on that basis, the Federal Housing Administration guaranteed loans made by banks to Levitt to, for the purpose of financing the construction of this development. So Levittown was built um, as an explicitly whites-only project for returning war veterans uh, by requirement of the federal government. Again, I want to emphasize, this is not de facto segregation. This is not because African Americans looked at the houses in Levittown and decided they didn't like them. It's because they were forbidden from buying them. I'm, uh, I'm writing a book now about this history, and one of the stories I'm telling in the book is about an African American war veteran who came back from World War II and um, formed, with, along with, a number, with his, several of his brothers and his relatives, a, um, a company, a trucking company, that got a contract with Levitt to uh, deliver um, sheetrock to uh, the development as it was being built for the walls and the development. Became a prosperous company. Um, he owned several trucks, as all his brothers and, and uh, uh, nephews were able to work there. At the end of uh, the construction, a couple of his nephews wanted to buy homes in the development that they built. But of course, they were prohibited from doing so because African Americans weren't permitted to build, to buy homes in Levittown. Initially, many of the homes were rented. Two families were evicted because they uh, invited some uh, African American playmates to play with their children. And that was the basis for eviction. And this was a federally funded project. Now, this went on around the country. Uh, another well known one, uh, some of you, uh, maybe all of you know, uh, remember a song that Pete Seeger used to sing about uh, houses on a hillside made of ticky-tacky and they all look the same. Well, that song was written by Malvina Reynolds as she was driving that by the, uh, or the idea for the song came to her as she was driving uh, by the Westlake development in Daly City. It was another development that um, was built by um, uh, 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 Dolger, Henry Dolger, a builder who got Federal Housing Administration guarantees to upfront his uh, construction costs and from which African Americans were um, excluded explicitly and by requirement of the federal government. Uh, 
Richmond, I mentioned before, um, had a burgeoning African-American and white population during the war, explosive growth. During the war, the federal government financed another builder in this area, David Bohannon, um, became one of the largest and most uh, prominent builders in the country, to build a uh, subdivision outside Richmond uh, called Rollingwood. It's still uh, the Rollingwood neighborhood still exists today outside of Richmond, on condition that no homes be sold to African Americans. San Lorenzo Village was built um, uh, on the same uh, basis, financed by the federal government in the sense that the federal government guarantees for bank loans on condition that no homes be sold to African Americans. Uh, another story I'm telling in this uh, uh, book I'm writing is a story of uh, an African American worker who came to work in a Ford Motor plant in um, Richmond. Um, he. Uh, Ford set up its first automobile assembly plant in Richmond in 1931 uh, and would not hire black workers. It had a sign outside uh, that said no Negro or Mexicans wanted uh, on the, uh, and this, by the way, this is, this is in Richmond. I know you like to think of the San Francisco Bay Area as the most liberal area in the country, uh, but this was in, in Richmond, California. Um, but during the war, there was such an enormous labor supply. The Ford plant had uh, been converted, taken over by the government, converted to tank production. Uh, and there was such an enormous labor shortage that uh, they had to begin hiring African Americans. And so one of the stories I'm telling is uh, of a, a man who, who came to California in that period from Louisiana, and got a job in the Ford Motor Plant um, at the time when it was making tanks. After the war, it converted to civilian production, assembling cars again. And um, uh, it continued to, to assemble cars from the end of the war until 1955. Now, um, back again in that time, the, uh, the war, we didn't have a lot of highways in this country. The only way to uh, get building materials and parts was by ship. So plants had to be built along the shoreline in deep water ports. Uh, they didn't have a lot of land available. The Ford Motor Plant in Richmond was a two-story plant. By the way, any of you have been there? It's, uh, it's, now called the, it's now a national park, that plant. It's called the Rosie the Riveter uh, National Historical Park. That's the old Ford plant, and it's, um, it celebrates uh, women who worked in, in places like Ford. Um, but it had uh, about 20% of its workforce was African-American by the end of the war, and through the 1940s, but by the mid-1950s, that technology was obsolete. Highways were being built, so you didn't need to depend on ships to deliver parts and to take the, the assembled cars away. And if you could uh, be away from deep water ports, then you could um, spread out the plant and, and not have multiple stories with, with, with uh, elevators uh, taking parts from one level to another. So Ford announced it was going to close the plant. and. Um, uh, build a new plant in Milpitas, now part of the Silicon Valley. Um, Milpitas at that time was in a rural area, um, and uh, uh, lots of land available, so they built a plant. Other, industry, other uh, factories moved there as well. The UAW, the United Auto Workers, that had organized the automobile industry in the late 1930s and early 1940s, um, negotiated an agreement with um, uh, Ford, that all workers in the Richmond plant could transfer to Milpitas. The problem was that there was no place south of Oakland where African American workers were permitted to live. The federal government had built, had subsidized in the same way it subsidized um, uh, uh, Westlake and Daly City or Levittown or Rollingwood outside Richmond, had subsidized a number of subdivisions in the Milpitas area for whites only. But once you pass the, uh, the southern border of Oakland, there was no place where African Americans were permitted to live by federal policy. By federal policy. Um, and the same thing was true everywhere in the country. It was true in New York, it was true in St. Louis, it was true in Cleveland and Chicago and Baltimore and Detroit and uh, here in the Bay Area. The, white, the, the federal government had an explicit policy to suburbanize the white population. This actually goes back uh, even before 
um, uh, the post-war period. It actually started after World War I, when the federal government uh, decided that the way to uh, stop communism was to get the white families of this country to live in single-family homes, because if you owned your own home, you couldn't be a communist. That was the rationale of the Woodrow Wilson administration, and that uh, crusade was then taken up by Herbert Hoover in the 1920s. Um, Herbert Hoover uh, was Secretary of Commerce during that period, and um, had a, a number of programs uh, to um, own, called Own Your Own Home, directed at white families. Uh, the, the Department of Commerce that he headed during the 1920s sent speakers around the country urging whites to uh, move to the suburbs to avoid racial strife. And that was the reason to own your own home. This was a federal program. Um, in any event, uh, continuing with my story, so the, the, my friend couldn't uh, uh, move to, um, uh, to the uh, Milpitas area. He happened to keep his job by uh, renting a, uh, or buying rather, a van um, with eight other African-American workers who had worked there, and they drove an hour plus each way, there was no 880 freeway at that time, uh, to Milpitas from their homes in Richmond. And uh, they kept their jobs un until that plant closed, but uh, most workers couldn't. Um, other plants moved there and refused to hire African-Americans on the grounds that they would be absent too often because of traffic problems, because they had to um, commute from um, Oakland. Now, Let's play out what this actually means in terms of the history of African Americans in the Bay Area. Well, families that bought homes, say, in the Milpitas area, or um, in Daly City, or um, uh, in the outskirts of, of San Francisco, families uh, that bought those homes bought them at the time. They sold for about seven or eight thousand dollars a piece in the late 1940s. Now. Of course, in today's dollars, that's about $100,000. So I'm going to stop talking about $1947 now. Uh, from now on, I'll convert it all to um, current dollars. But uh, remember that, that uh, that's, that's, what the, that's what I'm doing. All right, so they, they, they sold these homes. Uh, Bohannon sold um, homes in the, uh, Milpitas uh, and in Richmond. Uh, Dolger sold homes south of San Francisco for about $100,000 apiece. White families were, in effect, subsidized to move to those homes. The purchase price that they paid, that white families paid for those homes uh, in the 19, early uh, 1950s, late 1940s, say $100,000, they got mortgages. If they were veterans, there was nothing down. Their monthly carrying charges were less than the rent that they were paying in public housing that they left. Remember, public housing wasn't for poor people. It was for working class, middle class families. So that when, when they were subsidized to move from public housing to single family homes in the suburbs, they were the rent, the, the monthly carrying charges on their mortgages with no down payment that they paid on these homes was less than they were paying in rent in public housing. Um, today, those homes, in Milpitas, uh, in Westlake, uh, in the outskirts, in, in um, uh, the outskirts of Richmond, those homes now sell for four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. They're still modest homes, relatively speaking. The white families who move to those communities with federal subsidy and guarantees of racial homogeneity, the white families and their children and their grandchildren have gained over the next two generations about $400,000 in wealth, in equity appreciation. They've used that equity appreciation to send their children to college, to um, retire um, to uh, a warmer place. Uh, uh, they've, they've bequeathed what's left to their children and grandchildren who themselves use it as down payments for homes. The African Americans who, like the Ford worker I described um, uh, uh, work, who, who couldn't move to Milpitas. The African Americans refused access to those white middle class communities and wound up living in uh, urban areas, Richmond, Oakland, um, 
gain none of that equity appreciation. Today, nationwide, the average incomes of African-American families is about 60% of the average income of white families. But the average wealth, the wealth that permits you to put a down payment on a home, or the wealth that permits you to uh, send your children to college, the average wealth of African-American families today is 5% of white wealth. Average income, 60%. Average wealth, 5%. That difference between 5% average wealth and 60% average income is almost entirely attributable to racially explicit policies of segregation of the federal government. If somebody tells you that African Americans have low incomes and can't afford to move to the suburbs, they're telling the truth. They can't afford to move to the suburbs. But the reason they can't afford to move to the suburbs is predominantly because of federal racial policy. It's not because they happen to be there. Now, what happened in 1968? Well, we passed the Fair Housing Law, and you all are, are uh, committed, and I commend you, to enforcing it. But what good does a Fair Housing Law do to families like just, I just described? We said, in effect, to African Americans in 1968, okay, African Americans, you're now free to move to Rollingwood or to Milpitas or to Daly City or to Levittown um, or to any of the other of hundreds and hundreds of communities like that around the country. But 1950, roughly, when those houses went for sale to whites only for $100,000, $100,000 was twice national median income. Twice national media income with a mortgage is easily affordable to working class families. I mean, you don't have to be rich. If you, have a, if you can buy a home for twice the national median income, anybody can afford it who has a job. Today, those homes sell for seven and eight times national median income. That is a home that uh, the national median income today is about $50,000. Homes that sell for $400,000, $500,000 are not affordable to working class or lower middle class or even middle class families. So for most African Americans, and I'm not minimizing the very, very important work you do, the Fair Housing Act does nothing. Now what if we understood the history that I've just described? What if we understood how the, the racial patterns of every metropolitan area are de jure segregation, not de facto? Well, we have a, a federal constitution that prohibits de jure segregation. We have a Fifth Amendment that prohibits the federal government from, um, from racial discrimination. So all the policies that I've just described to you were a violation of the constitution, a violation of the federal government's constitutional responsibilities. We have a 14th Amendment, which not only prohibits um, uh, uh, state governments and their subdivisions from acting in a discriminatory fashion, but imposes a further obligation of requiring that they treat people equally. And we have a 13th Amendment, which uh, not only prohibited slavery, pro prohibits but requires a Congress to enact laws to eliminate the badges and incidents of slavery, that is, second-class citizenship. So all of these policies that I've described, and I, I said at the beginning, I've only described two of them so far. There were many, many others. And uh, if I had a week, I could talk to you about them. I, I could talk endlessly about this. Uh, all of those policies were a violation of, of um, the government's constitutional responsibility. What that means is that it's not only a good idea to integrate. Whether you think it's a good idea or not, it's a constitutional obligation. It's a constitutional obligation to reverse the policies that created the segregated landscape that we know in metropolitan areas today. And if we took that obligation seriously, we would think very, very differently about policies. And I am not suggesting that you and the, the fair housing community of Marin have the ability to do any of this. But I, I think it's important for you to know this background because unless we start talking about these uh, this history and the constitutional obligation that it imposes upon us, we will never be in a position to do more 
then um, enforce the, the Fair Housing Act, which itself is very important. But what would we do if we understood that uh, not only Marin County, but uh, uh, Alameda County and um, every other um, suburban county in this country was segregated unconstitutionally? Well, here's the kind of thing we would think about. And I'm throwing this out not because I think uh, it's seriously possible. It's not seriously possible because we don't have the understanding, the background understanding to mobilize in favor of it. But here's a constitutional remedy. Those homes sold in 1950 for $100,000. Today they sell for $500,000. Take uh, I know, the San Francisco Bay Area, 10% um, of the population uh, is African American today. The next 10% of the homes that come up for sale in Milpitas, say, should be purchased by the federal government for $500,000 or whatever they cost on the market, and then resold to qualified African Americans for $100,000. That would be a constitutionally required remedy narrowly targeted to the violation that, that, that was committed. Uh, I'll tell you that I've, uh, I've given lectures like this to many um, audiences of lawyers, and no lawyer has ever yet told me why that's not a constitutionally required remedy. Of course, there's no political support for anything like that. And there won't be so long as we don't reacquaint ourselves with this history. Now, let me say this. The history was once well known. The, the, the things I've described to you uh, this morning, it's not anything I dug up myself. You know, I've spend some time in archives digging up specific examples. But all of this stuff has been well written about. Uh, it's written about in, in a number of books that scholars read all the time that are taught in history classes. One is called American Apartheid by Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton. Another is Crabgrass Frontier, um, uh, written um, by uh, uh, Jackson. Um, I forget his first name right now. Uh, anybody remember? Anyhow. Um, Jackson is the last. Uh, author, uh, the last name of the author. Um, it's all been well described. And, and let me say, I did, uh, the reason I put um, my email address there is because I always forget something when I'm getting a lecture like this. And so I invite you to write a, a note to me if there's anything you want to ask me further or um, want to discuss any of the issues that uh, even those that I haven't discussed. But um, in 1968, Richard Nixon was elected president of the United States. And uh, he appointed as his secretary of housing and urban development a man named George Romney, uh, the father of someone uh, with whom you may be familiar. And George Romney, as secretary of, the housing, of, of housing and urban development, knew this history that I've been describing well, as did most uh, reasonably well-educated Americans. George Romney said that we've created a white noose. The federal government has created a white noose around African-American neighborhoods throughout this country. Negro neighborhoods, he said. Uh, and it's the federal government's obligation, and his obligation as Secretary of HUD, to untie that noose. And he implemented a program called Open Communities, based on the history that I've just described, his constitutional obligation to desegregate the suburbs that the federal government had segregated a program of open communities which included three elements. One, a requirement that suburbs repeal exclusionary zoning laws. That is, laws that, that uh, uh, prohibit the construction of anything but uh, single family homes uh, with large square footage and on large acreages. Things that prevent, not poor people, but moderate, middle class, working class families from moving into those suburbs. Secondly, for families of lower incomes, that every suburb has to um, permit the building of subsidized moderate income housing. And third, that every suburb has to have its fair share, is the term we use today, fair share of public housing for the poorest of families. Every suburb, the most affluent suburbs, not just those in the ringing urban areas like Ferguson, but the more affluent suburbs. And George Romney actually began to implement this program um, called Open Communities. Um, 
He actually withheld federal funds. Every, every metropolitan area requires federal funds, even the most affluent areas, whether it's for sewers or for water projects of other kinds or open space. Um, he withheld federal funds from three um, sub uh, suburban areas nationwide. One was Baltimore County that's been in the news so much. And there was a white backlash uh, to his program. Uh, Richard Nixon, the president, reined him in, eventually forced him out of the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And we've had nothing anywhere near as proactive uh, since in the last uh, 50 years. What we need to do, it seems to me, uh, is to reacquaint ourselves with the history that even George Romney knew and talked about. Because unless we reacquaint ourselves with that history, our vision of what we need to do today will be too narrow. Unless we learn that we have a constitutional obligation to undo the racial policies that our government imposed to create a segregated America, unless we understand that history, we will not be in a position to discuss even more reasonable policies than the one I laid out uh, to desegregate this country. Not simply to prohibit future discrimination, but to reverse the past discrimination that segregated the country. So um, I'm going to take questions now for a few minutes. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. And um, Shall I call on people, Carolyn, or do you want to? Or, uh, you want to go ahead and... Okay, sure. There may be... <clears throat> Okay. All right. Well, I might. Oh, okay, Glenn. Huh? Those are two big questions. Uh, the first one, of course, throughout most of the 20th century, <clears throat> except in, in California and Texas, African Americans were the only um, minority of any significant number. Of course, uh, early in the 20th century, uh, Jews and Italians and other Europeans weren't considered white either. Um, but uh, the federal policies were directed specifically at African Americans. They were not directed at other minorities. We also have today, you know, we need to separate two separate issues. One is the unconstitutional segregation of African Americans. That was specifically directed at African Americans. The other problem we have in this country is have a normal social and economic inequality. There are low-income families, um, particularly recent immigrants, who are living in, in um, racially or, or ethnically isolated neighborhoods who have limited mobility, and it would be good social policy to help to integrate those families into the broader society. But it's not a constitutional obligation to do it. There's not a constant, when we have recent Mexican immigrants, for example, recent immigrants, low-wage immigrants, and I lived in the Los Angeles area for a long time, who, who moved to East Los Angeles when they first come here. They moved to East Los Angeles because they need to live in a community where their language is spoken, where rents are cheap, uh, they're very low-wage uh, workers. Um, they're not living there because federal policy required Mexicans to live in East Los Angeles. For African Americans, it was entirely different. So when I was living in Los Angeles, uh, I was actually living in a community called Whittier. Now when Mexican immigrants come to Los Angeles, they first settle in East Los Angeles, and then you know, they get jobs as janitors or, or night watchmen, and they move to Pico Rivera, and then their children go to school, and they get educated, and their children move to Whittier. There were no African Americans with here. The African Americans remained um, and, and were continued to be restricted to African American neighborhoods. Um, so there's much more mobility for other groups 
in this country today than there is even today than there is for African Americans, which is not to say that it is a matter of social policy, not constitutional remedy, but social policy, that we shouldn't be doing more to uh, assist the integration into American society of other minority groups. We should. Um, as for the, your question about education, you know, I'm, I'm working now on a, a report about Flint, Michigan, and uh, lead poisoning, of course. Um, so if you take a child, let's say you take a child in an African-American community uh, who has suffered from lead poisoning, and that's where lead poisoning is uh, concentrated. You know, everybody used to suffer from lead poisoning, but we removed lead from gasoline. And so whites and other um, um, non-black communities no longer are breathing a lot of lead, but the lead is concentrated in the lowest income ghettos where African-Americans live. So you take a, a child with lead poisoning, we know that lead poisoning has a uh, measurable, uh, um, causes a measurable decrease in IQ. As a child with a fairly low level of lead poisoning typically has an IQ of five to 10 points lower than children who've never been exposed to lead poisoning. Well, if you take a child uh, like that with um, uh, lead poisoning, that child's achievement is going to be predicted to be lower than that of children who haven't suffer from lead poisoning. It's a, a biological tragedy, but it's true. Um, lead, uh, lead blocks the absorption of calcium in young children's uh, brains and, and prevents their development. So if you have a child with lead poisoning and that child is in a school where not everybody has lead poisoning, the teacher can devote special attention to that child and uh, can uh, provide additional help and resources to that child. So the child will achieve at a higher level than that child otherwise would have. The child will never achieve at the same level as uh, on typical children. Of course, there, there's a distribution of outcomes for every characteristic. But typical children with lead poisoning are never going to achieve at the same level as typical children without them. But if you have a child like that who's in a school where not everybody is lead poisoned, the teacher can devote special attention to that child. If you have a school where every child has that kind of social or economic disadvantage, and it's not just lead poisoning, it's not having been read to at home because the parents are not well educated, or it's walking to school through a neighborhood of violence and ha coming to school with that kind of stress, or it's ha having um, a, f a family with um, unemployment and the stress that that causes in a home, or um, all of the other social and economic disadvantages that uh, children in uh, disadvantaged communities come to. If you have a classroom that's filled with children like that, every child can't get special attention. Uh, and so the average achievement of children in a school like that is inevitably going to be lower. And we have a, we've had a crazy school reform uh, movement in the last 20 years which says if only teachers have high expectations, none of this other stuff matters. But it does matter. So I came to the conclusion that um, the only way to raise the achievement of disadvantaged children, and particularly African-American children, is in integrated schools, where teachers can devote special attention to children who come to school with social and economic disadvantages, because not every child in the classroom has those disadvantages. And then I came to the conclusion that you can't desegregate schools unless you desegregate neighborhoods, because most schools are segregated, as the Supreme Court acknowledged, because they're located in segregated neighborhoods. So that's actually how I came to this topic, as, as I said earlier, and, and I think they are inextricably intertwined. Unless we aggressively pursue desegregation, the quest that we've had for the last 30 years in this country to close the black-white achievement the gap in education is going to be unsuccessful. My name is Tara McGrew, and thank you, Dr. Rothstein, for bringing forth the importance of understanding the historical uh, boundaries and barriers that created our um, segregated communities. I'm a native of Oakland, California, and um, my parents came to California at the second migration. My family lived in Cornish Village. My uncle, um, Sam O'Dell, along with Byron Rumford, created and developed the first and original ACORN projects in West Oakland. I am currently writing on that 
because that history is not there. So I wanted to bring that forth and thank you. My question is, is that you just brought up a really great um, solution um, that came forth in the 60s, and that is the open communities. How do you see, my question is, is you're saying that we should reverse those policies and, and provide housing for African Americans. Are you saying reversing the, the, the policies in the suburbs where we are now experiencing in Oakland, California, African Americans having to move to the suburbs um, and those are in Pittsburgh and Antioch, where we are seeing gentrification in Oakland. So does that remedy apply only to the suburbs, or can that be implemented and put into the urban core like Oakland in helping and stopping the gentrification and also the flight of African Americans having to go to the suburbs. Because I know from an economic standpoint that the central business district is in Oakland. It's in San Francisco. That's where the businesses are. That's where people are coming in. That's where they want to be. So if we need to have a job match for African Americans who have been traditionally disenfranchised or even the, the barriers that have prohibited them from getting jobs, and they're in the city, and we're being forced to the suburbs, how does that apply? Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, well, first thing, uh, you need to find me after this lecture so we can compare notes on the books we're writing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, ha I, I support gentrification. I think every community should be gentrified including the most affluent suburbs. What that means is what we need to aspire to is metropolitan areas in which every community is diverse economically. Um, so why are African Americans in this area when they're being forced out of um, their previous neighborhoods going to places only like Antioch and only like Pittsburgh? The reason is because they are still excluded from, they shouldn't be moving to just some suburbs. We should have opportunities in every community for people who are leaving urban areas, and we should be controlling the gentrification so, as you say, uh, there will be remaining opportunities for low and moderate income people to live in those communities. So we need both, uh, you're, you're all familiar with this termination, we need both the prohibition of exclusionary zoning laws, and we need inclusionary zoning requirements in um, every uh, community in the country. The federal government, you know, still, uh, and, and uh, Carolyn mentioned this, this earlier in the introduction, the federal government still reinforces the segregation that it created. The federal government reinforces the segregation through two policies. One, and, and now I'm talking about things that you know more about than I do, I imagine. One is the low-income housing tax credit program, and the other is the housing choice voucher program. Uh, the low-income housing tax credit program gives subsidies, gives tax subsidies to developers who build low and, uh, it should be low and moderate income, but most of them build just low-income housing. And the Housing Choice Voucher Program, popularly known as Section 8, gives subsidies to um, uh, families to enable them to, to uh, rent apartments at rents they otherwise couldn't afford. But the low-income housing tax credit program is used predominantly to place new developments for low-income families in already segregated neighborhoods. That should be prohibited. Far short of the big program I talked about before where the federal government buys up 10% of all the, the affluent homes and resells them at discounts to African Americans, that's an immediate policy we could implement. We could prohibit the use of the low-income housing tax credit program in uh, already segregated low-income communities and require that they be built in high-opportunity areas. The second, uh, so far as the Housing Choice Voucher Program, that also is used predominantly to reinforce segregation because most Housing Choice Vouchers are used in already segregated neighborhoods. Housing Choice Vouchers is not a, um, the Section 8 program, it's not an entitlement. So we have long waiting lists 
uh, for those programs. There are some communities that have begun to have what mobility programs that give a preference to families, Section 8 housing voucher families, who are willing to use those vouchers in high opportunity neighborhoods, and that requires providing more social supports and other supporting services to enable them to do that. But we could make that a nationwide policy. There are so many, the waiting lists are so long for Section 8 vouchers that we could easily restrict them only to families who are willing to use them to desegregate. Um, so those are two policies that, uh, as I say, could be changed immediately without going as far as George Romney's or his my crazy ideas. Can I, Carolyn, should I stop or do you want me to continue? All right, one more question. Hello, um, my name is Rachel Guinness. I'm the executive director of Lily Pad Homes. We work on facilitating the development of second units and are working on creating ordinances and hopefully state law to make the repurposing of spare bedrooms easily and inexpensively permitted. Um, I had a question about the enforcement of the rules that you were just um, for, for segregation. Um, fascinating conversation. And I was wondering, it must have been the mechanism to maintain it must have been through the um, lending, um, through lending, and I can say that the same kind of restrictions were put on women um, as far as getting mortgages um, on their own. And so I was just wondering um, how that's been corrected and is there so much oversight that um, segregation in uh, mortgage lending no longer exists or, or, or discrimination in mortgage lending? Well, you're, you're correct. The way this was enforced was you know, we're, most people are familiar with the term redlining. Uh, the term redlining refers to a program that was started early in the New Deal, like the Public Works Administration that I described, by uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation that drew, um, uh, that drew maps of every metropolitan area in the country and uh, uh, colored them differently developed depending on the level of risk for uh, federal mortgage insurance. And uh, the uh, neighborhoods that were considered high risk if they included African Americans, were colored red, and so that's called redlining, and African Americans were not uh, eligible for mortgages um, by either the Home Loan Owners Loan Corporation or the Federal Housing Administration. Actually, the Home Owners Loan Corporation did give loans to African Americans, but the FHA stopped that. Um, so that's where the redline, but the far more powerful policy was this uh, uh, policy of, of um, production loans, which did it on a mass suburban basis uh, and then it was then carried forward through the individual mortgage policy. So as I was describing in Levittown, uh, Levitt got the, um, the production loan for 17,000 homes by getting pre-approval to, and the, uh, the I didn't describe this before, technically the way this worked, he's got pre-approval from the FHA for the design of the homes and for the racial exclusion. The FHA actually required him to put language in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans. But he then could take that to a bank, and the bank would then know that anybody who bought a home would be guaranteed an FHA mortgage. So that's actually the way, the way it worked, is that the, um, the FHA uh, mortgages were only available to African Americans, and uh, only available to whites and not to African Americans. And the Federal Housing Administration actually had a um, a manual uh, called the uh, Underwriter's Manual that it issued to all appraisers for individual mortgages. It did, wasn't necessary for um, these mass subdivisions because those were already pre-approved, but for any individual homeowner who wanted an FHA mortgage, the appraisers had to use this manual, and the manual um, said that it was a high risk to um, guarantee the mortgage uh, you know, for a home where there were incompatible racial elements. And uh, the, uh, uh, it required, for example, that uh, it, another high-risk factor was if there wasn't a natural barrier, like a highway, that separated African-American from white neighbors. There was one case in Detroit where somebody wanted to build a development only for whites. The FHA refused to give advanced production guarantees because there was no barrier between it and uh, an African-American community, so the builder built a six-foot wall along the edge of his community, and then the Federal Housing Administration guaranteed the, uh, the loan. So the mechanism was these individual mortgages. Um, and today, which is your question, yeah, today uh, it's now um, unlawful to discriminate uh, in the issuing of mortgages. Uh, we have a requirement that banks have to um, uh, 
serve the communities in which they uh, uh, they lend, and therefore they can't uh, they have to do a certain proportion of their lending in disadvantaged communities. But um, and that's all. And enforcing that is what I think your mission is, and it's a very important mission because we need to, as well as tackling the big problem, we need to tackle it incrementally as well. But I, I, I but the main, my main point is that in addition to preventing ongoing discrimination, we haven't even begun to talk about how do we reverse the segregation that we've already created and abuse, disabuse ourselves of the myth that this somehow happened by accident and, and uh, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. That's it? Okay, I'm told I can't take any more questions, but... Thank you. I will take unlimited, unlimited questions on email, and the website at the bottom is where I've written a lot about this, and, and there's sources there and documentation of everything. I haven't made any of this stuff up, I assure you. Okay, thank you.